I'm hitting the road next week for a little tour out west, and I'd love to see you at one of my shows. On April 30th, I'll be playing a house concert in Albuquerque, New Mexico. On May 2nd, I'll be playing a Western Folklife Center event at the Zion Bank Building in Salt Lake City, Utah. On May 3rd, I'll be playing a house concert in Salt Lake City, Utah. On May 4th, I'll be playing at the Western Folklife Center in Elko, Nevada. On May 5th, I'll be playing at the Mountain Music Parlor in Reno, Nevada. On May 11th, I'll be playing at Flynn's Cabaret and Steakhouse in Felton, California, just outside of Santa Cruz. On May 12th, I'll be playing a house concert in Santa Clarita, California. And finally, on May 17th, I'll be playing a house concert in Colorado City, Arizona. You can find more info about all of these shows at my website, andyhedges.com. While you're there, you can join my email list to stay updated on future shows. I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by panhandle cowboy and poet Larry McWhorter. This piece is entitled Trilogy for Sissy. It's a breezy 10 degrees, December 1985. A hooded, rather slow-looking boy walks down the street carrying an egg crate. Not a disturbing sight, but unusual. Unable to resist my own wit, I quip, Your yolks will freeze, boy. Taint eggs, he mutters, opens the box, and changes my life. A face which couldn't decide if it desired to be blue or white, so it split the difference, popped out like a jack-in-the-box. Scrambling atop her siblings to reach me, Hindered by stubby legs and pot belly, she failed at leaping into my arms, but found her mark in my heart. Eyes so intelligent I felt inferior said, I need a home and you're it, pal. Defeated, yet needing to make a stand, I said, I don't need a damned dog, but Holly does. June 1986 finds me mounted on a weekend warrior's excursion. An enthusiastic yet obedient pup follows Frank and me in search of foot rot. I fall in on a steer. So does she. Sissy, get back here, I yell and point behind my horse. She stays there the rest of the day. At home, I gazed on her sleeping form and feel her dreams resemble mine. She did so well, and my eyes cloud with knowing she'll never be what she was meant to be. Alone at Dad's, Holly, asleep on the couch, is suddenly wakened by a snarling brute, which resembles our cordial pet in size and color only. Two intruders, friends of Dad's, stand in the doorway, hats in hand. Sissy straddles my startled wife. Raised hair and bared teeth say, mine. A misunderstanding, but a point made. As we visit, I watch her at play with the villains, now victims of fetch. All is forgotten, but by me. No code words or trained reaction, no accidental robotic attack. A purely protective act of agape love, which can't be bought, only given. No longer the family pet, she is now a family member, status earned through right of passage, all too often failed by true blood kin. She puts her ball in my idle hand and dares it to escape. It makes a valiant attempt, but fails again. As she returns with the fugitive, my thoughts return to an earlier day. She did so well, and my eyes cloud with knowing I had been wrong. She is exactly what she was meant to be. Mr. McCorder, Sissy's up here again. Sorry for the bother, I'll be right up. No, no bother, she's playing with the kids, just letting you know she's here. Goodbye. Chuckling, I hang up the phone. How many such calls? No idea. Ambassador? 
guardian, babysitter, clown, $500 laughed at once. Like me, a social gadabout, a new acquaintance or old friend, she sees no difference, always visiting her only vice. Trusting luck, I allow it, over the protests of my wife. Too much freedom, too near the road, but she never goes near it until today. A drizzly September day, 1991. Recent rains make for easy digging for the first foot or so. Then I hit the rocks. My rock bar pounds mercilessly, steadily, into the blameless truck driver's brain. I told you so, pounds mercilessly, steadily, into mine. The grave is two hours in the digging. A collar hanging on the black walnut's limb, a hatefully silent mound of black dirt. All I've left of a precious child I loved too much to contain. Kneeling beside the end result of five years love and training, I wonder how many grieving parents have wept those exact same tears for the exact same reason. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is John Erickson. John Erickson is a writer, musician, and a rancher. He has written and published 75 books and more than 600 articles but he's best known as the author of the popular series of books, Hank the Cowdog. John was kind enough to invite me into his home on his ranch in Perryton, Texas, and we sat down in his living room and recorded this interview. Towards the end of the interview, you can hear John's wife preparing lunch for us, and so I hope as you hear that background noise, it makes you feel like you're sitting right there in the ranch house with me and John. Here's John Erickson. Well, I was born in uh, Midland, Texas. My my father, I was born during World War II when my dad was in the Pacific. And my mother was living in Seminole with her parents. My grandfather and great-grandfather were ranchers in Gaines County. And... Uh, were among the first families to arrive on the South Plains. Uh, my great great grandparents were uh, among a colony of Quakers that came from Ohio and the Midwest and settled in what became the first town above the Caprock. It was called Estacado. I think that that they got there in 1879, and my ancestors came in 1880. So I have roots very deep on the South Plains. My great-grandmother was, she attended school in Estacado and graduated from high school and married a cowboy who had come up from Oh, Palo Pinto and Jack County, that country on the Brazos River. He was living and working on a ranch that might have belonged to the Slaughters. I'm not sure about that, but uh, it was off the Cap Rock, north of Post and uh, southeast of Crosbyton. The only people that had daughters were Quakers in Estacada. And they did not want their daughters associating with cowboys. They considered cowboys rowdy riffraff 
But somehow, uh, Joe Sherman met Perlina Underhill, and uh, they eventually got married in the Quaker Church in Estacado. And he went into ranching. He had a fourth grade education. What learning he acquired, he acquired on his own through experience, taught himself to read, and became a, a reader. He, until his death, he had a, a book of Shakespeare's plays beside his bed. He ranched around uh, Lubbock. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, that ranch was uh, near what is now Shallow Water. And uh, in 1905, a lot of uh, farmers were coming into the area. And he didn't care for farmers or farming and uh, or people for that matter. So they drove their cow herd 90 miles south to Seminole and established a ranch there. And that's where my grandmother was raised. She was born in Estacada and uh, but came to manhood, I mean womanhood in on this ranch around Seminole and uh, went eight through eight grades in, in a little one-room schoolhouse for ranch kids and she wanted more education and the only place to go unless you went all the way to Dallas or Fort Worth or Austin to a university the only place to get some higher education was uh, there was a a convent in Stanton that was run by nuns Stanton was on the railroad they established this school for ranch kids and it must have been a pretty good place my my grandmother had a lot of uh, polish she spoke flawless English and was a a well-educated woman she had five daughters married a a guy who was a county clerk and later got into the ranching business and that's where my ancestors are buried in that Gaines County Cemetery. So I have ranching genes that go back quite a ways. My mother married a a guy who was working as a landman during the Depression. He came down from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and he he liked West Texas and and wanted to stay here. And he met my mother when he was doing some uh, legal research in the courthouse in Seminole. And they were married in my grandparents' backyard. And uh, my mother was living in Seminole during the war. I guess the nearest hospital was Midland. That's where I was born. Uh, when my dad came back uh, from the Pacific, they lived in Midland for several years. I have a few very faint memories of Midland. And then we moved to Perryton, and uh, that's where I started school in 1950 and graduated in 62. My parents didn't have any ranch land around Perryton. Uh, there were two family ranches in Gaines County, which was about a five and a half hour drive or six hour drive in those days. My mother was a storyteller I didn't go to kindergarten. I stayed home with her and uh, spent a lot of time with her. And she, she spent a lot of time telling me stories about her father, her grandfather, her uncles, who were all involved in ranching and cowboying. And that was something that I, that always interested me. And uh, when I was in probably junior high school, I had the opportunity to start working on ranches, and uh, that's what I did through high school, and even in college, I'd come back and take up where I left off. But it was always something that I considered important. 
I never thought I'd be able to go back to it after college. You know, college messes up bean pickers and cowboys, makes them think that they are too good for that. But I went off, couldn't wait to see New York City and get away from sandstorms and blizzards and droughts and the Texas Panhandle. Got to New York just as quick as I could and I figured that's where I'd end up living. After my freshman year in college, I got a job uh, working with a church in East Harlem. So I jumped right in the middle of New York City. Typical country kid, never worried about my safety. I never uh, had any trouble in New York. I loved New York. The people there were a little, a little distant because they lived around 13 million people, and that's the way you get. But uh, they were very cordial to me, and I loved the city. And I went back two years later and worked in a church in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. After UT, I went to Harvard Divinity School for two years and lived in Cambridge and Boston. And uh, one day after I'd been there, in my, I was in my second year, I was walking through the Harvard College campus and it suddenly struck me that I would never be one of those people and it was a disappointment. I tried to wash Texas off and uh, I wasn't able to do it. I left Harvard three hours short of a master's degree and we moved back to Texas. I thought I might go back and finish up but the longer I stayed away the less important I thought a master's degree was. I couldn't think of anything I could do with a master's that I wanted to do. About all you can do with it is teach, and I didn't want to be a teacher. So we just left it at that. In 1970, we came to visit my folks and uh, just never quite got away and uh, lived with my folks for a month or so, and then my dad said, well, why don't you why don't you get a house and hang around here until you figure out what you want to do? So I did. I got a job working on a farm, then took a job as a bartender, which I hated, but I had to do it for three years. It gave me the opportunity to write in the mornings. And uh, by that time, I, had, I was writing in a disciplined way. I started that when I got married and uh, realized that I needed to get serious about some kind of a career. So I was very serious about writing and uh, was doing whatever, whatever jobs I could find to pay the bills. In 1974, a guy associated with a bank he knew that I, I day work, even when I was doing these other things. I found a, a way to do ranch work on weekends. And he knew that, and he, he had just gotten a ranch in Oklahoma in trust, 5,000 acre ranch, and wondered if I wanted to manage it for the bank. So I dropped everything I was doing and headed for Beaver County, Oklahoma. Was on that ranch for four years was able to ride in the mornings and then that ranch went up for sale and we had to go to another ranch and then I got a ranch job in Texas close to Perryton so all told I, I was uh, cowboying for seven or eight years and and uh, it was something that I wanted to learn how to do and I was working with very good cowboys and I consider myself a PhD in the subject I wasn't the best that I was working with, but I was good enough to ride with the best. So I have this uh, this ranching gene that's uh, been with me ever since I was a kid. When I decided I was interested in riding, the only riders I knew were 
at universities. Nobody in Perryton had ever thought of being a writer. Nobody in my family had. So when I was at UT, the only writers I knew, and I didn't know many, they were all professors. And so I started writing what you might call academic or serious fiction in imitation of what I was reading at UT. It was, it was all serious and it was very depressing, but that's what everybody was doing at that time. If, if you were at UT and not writing depressing stories, it meant that you were a lightweight. And I didn't want to be that. So that was the model I followed and I started, I took a writing course at Harvard and started writing short stories and then started thinking about writing novels. The only thing I knew to do with a novel was to send it to a New York publisher so I did that for 15 years and uh, joined the Western Writers of America and tried to write historical fiction, chased editors around hotel lobbies, and I just never could succeed, never figured out what it took to succeed as a conventional novelist, or maybe I understood and didn't want to do it. There were a lot of people I met who were writing novels that were ashamed of what they were doing. They were writing what they called adult westerns. That was not something that I had any interest in doing. I think I could have gotten published if I had been willing to write the kind of fiction that they were looking for, but I just was not that desperate. John Erickson is best known as the author of the wonderful series of books, Hank the Cowdog. The Hank books are well loved by ranch kids and city kids from all over the country, including mine. I asked John to talk about how the first Hank the Cowdog book came about. This was in the 70s, and I tried writing uh, academic serious fiction and I just wasn't cut out for that. So then I started, when when I joined Western Writers of America, I started trying to write uh, historical westerns and I wrote several long historical novels. I just wasn't able to get them published. Uh, I met Elmer Kelton. He was a longtime member of Western Writers and he was he had found a way to get himself published. He started out writing pulp fiction for uh, magazines. From there, he went into novels, and his novels were uh, popular in a very small uh, group. A lot of libraries bought his books, and uh, that would be libraries in Texas and the West. I don't think Elmer had much of a following outside of the West, but he was very successful in what he was doing, and I I liked Elmer and admired him and uh, tried to write the kind of novels he was writing. I just wasn't able to get them published. And Oh, along in the mid-70s, maybe 75 or 76, I, I just got sick of getting rejection slips, and so I started writing short humorous pieces about my ranch work and I sent them to uh, the Cattleman Magazine and Livestock Weekly in San Angelo and a few other places but I did my literary apprenticeship writing for Western Horsemen, the Cattlemen and, and Livestock Weekly and I had no trouble getting published there. They were uh, not publishing literary fiction or depressing stories. They, they had never lost their sense of humor, even during the Vietnam War. So I was able to develop my natural interest in humor, which I, my parents both had a good sense of humor. So it was something that got buried when I was in universities. 
and uh, it came out when I started writing for Cow Papers. The first Hank story was a short piece that I wrote for the Cattleman magazine. Oddly enough, they didn't publish fiction. They were very emphatic. If you read their summary in Writer's Digest, they said, we do not publish fiction. But I was writing these nonfiction articles for them, and one day I got the idea of, of writing a story from the point of view of a horse, and I wrote a couple of stories uh, from the point of view of a horse, and then I thought of writing from the point of view of a dog, and uh, first Hank story uh, was narrated by this dog named Hank, who thinks of himself as head of ranch security and doesn't understand why the people are mad at him all the time. And he was based on an Australian shepherd that I knew in Oklahoma. He wasn't my dog, he belonged to a rancher. This dog was, uh, he was, had a good heart. He, he wanted to be a good dog, but he just, he was three bales short of a full load of brains. And uh, so he was trying to help and always in the way. He had no self-knowledge and he didn't know it. So that seemed to me to be a ver very funny character. So I wrote two short stories narrated by Hank and uh, then went on to other things. The cattleman ran them without a, a blink and uh, we all went on to other things. I didn't recognize that there was anything special about the Hank stories. I didn't, wouldn't have picked those two stories as the best things I'd ever written. I thought my best stories were stories narrated by horses. And, uh, but mm, in the 80s, I'd gotten so many rejection slips and uh, I wanted people to know that I was an author. I'd been writing for 14 or 15 years, every morning, four hours a day, seven days a week. And I couldn't explain to people in my hometown what I was doing. I mean, I'd gone off to college. I'd lived in New York and Boston, gone to Harvard Divinity School, and, and now I was working as a cowboy. That was a puzzle to people. What in the heck is he doing back here? So I would go out and read my stories aloud to the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and the ladies' clubs, and uh, they got a real good reception. People laughed and they enjoyed them. But the biggest laughs came from the Hank stories. And I was surprised about that. And people came up afterwards and said, man, that is really good. You, you need to do more with that dog. And that's when I got the idea of trying to give Hank a, a whole book. I didn't know whether I could do it or not. But I did, and uh, by that time I had given up uh, trying to figure out how to get along with New York publishers and I came up with this crazy idea that I got from Ace Reed actually. I did a, Ace Reed called me up in 1982 I think, 83, and uh, I'd never met him. I knew him by reputation as everybody else did. He was a cartoonist and his work was everywhere hanging on calendars on the wall and cartoons people had cut out of the paper and put on the refrigerator. And he called me up and said, I want you to write my story. Get your tail down to Kerrville. And uh, I said, Ace, I got a wife and three kids and a business. He said, well, get them in order and come on down. So we went to Kerrville expecting to stay two or three days and uh, I ended up staying three months Chris came back with the kids, and uh, what I had thought was going to be an article turned into the Ace Reed biography. But one of the things I learned about Ace was that he had trouble getting his cartoons published, and he wanted to bring out cartoon books and 
So he and his wife just started Ace Reed Enterprises, and they published his uh, calendars and his books. I think that's where I got the idea for Maverick Books. If Ace could do it, maybe I could too. So we started Maverick Books in our garage in uh, Perryton. I quit my job as a carpenter's helper. I, I'd starved out of cowboying by that time. And uh, I haven't had an honest job since then. My job then was to go out and sell books and make enough money to buy groceries and pay rent. And that was, uh, we started Maverick Books in September of 82. And uh, if we hadn't, I don't think there would ever have been a Hank book published because uh, those books are just too odd for conventional publishers, or they would have been at that time. And uh, I had no background, um, no no track record as a published author, and I just don't think anybody would have published them, so they didn't get a chance. We did it ourselves, and they were easy to sell in a real small area. We had to order a second printing of the first Hank book after a month. And uh, I was selling them in uh, western stores, drug stores, saddle shops, ran ads in Livestock Weekly and sold through the mail. And, and then I, I went out and did readings for groups. And after a reading, I'd sell books. Sometimes Chris had, was there to take the money. Sometimes our kids would, would take the money, and I'd sign the books. And uh, the first one was so easy to sell, I wondered if I could do a second one, and so I did wrote it in two weeks, which is, uh, I've never been able to match that. But we were, we didn't have time to fool around. We, I had to kick the wolf away from the door every morning. So I was riding in the early morning hours and then going out and doing programs, selling, selling books, taking orders, filling mail, and uh, Chris was also. And uh, then I start having to hire people and one thing led to another. Texas cowboy and poet Larry McWhorter once wrote this. I take a lot of pains to make sure that when a cowboy reads my stuff, he won't come away offended. I'd rather explain a line to one who doesn't know than apologize to someone who does know. I wanted to read that quote by Larry McWhorter because John Erickson's writing is rich with a sense of place and an insider's view of ranching and cowboy culture. I asked John to talk about the importance of sense of place in his writing. Obviously, place is one of the main characters in the in the stories. the uh, The terrain, the vegetation, the the wildlife, and the weather. I've used my experience with ranching as the source of this for all my characters and plot lines and uh, from the beginning it was very important uh, that I got it right. One of the problems we've had in taking these stories into movies and television <coughs> is that uh, people in that business don't necessarily have the same respect for place and local culture that, that I have and uh, what experience we've had in that area has has not been good and that's that's the only reason that Hank wasn't made into an animated movie or series of movies years ago we we've had opportunities and we just uh, 
were reluctant to uh, get ourselves involved with people who wouldn't take as good a care of it as it needed. Yeah, the the stories are definitely true to a place and a way of life. I went to a lot of trouble to learn the cowboy and ranch business and uh, it's important to me to uh, to maintain integ integrity of detail and accuracy of information. So when when kids in Lubbock or San Angelo read about a certain incident that happens with Slim Chance, the cowboy, and and the dogs, or with cattle or horses. It's probably something that that I've done myself or at least know on good authority that it could happen. So there's a certain amount of education that goes into uh, those stories as far as when kids read those books they're getting a good education on ranching and cowboying in my time and place. And of course some of that is is timeless because uh, people have been relating to horses, cattle, and dogs for probably 10,000 years at least. And those things don't change by time or location. They're just dogs are the same in China as they are here. And so it's no shock that uh, we have a Chinese publisher and they've published 30 or so Hank books in Chinese. Yeah, my mother grew up in that oral tradition because she was living with two generations of ranchers down in Seminole. And I got access to her storytelling when, when I was young. It made a deep impression on me, but I lost touch with that uh, when I was a teenage jackass and then went off to college. Universities don't have that oral tradition. They're, they are the tradition of the written word. So I lost contact with storytelling, that oral tradition. I got back to it in an odd way. Chris and I were living in Austin and we had some black friends there and uh, I was associating with those people. I played football and basketball with them and uh, we we got together and socially with uh, some couples and uh, whenever I was around those people they told stories and most of the time their stories were funny and uh, they were very good at it and these were people who were not educated they didn't have college degrees they didn't write books uh, some of them were illiterate I mean Mike could have written their names but no more than that but they could tell stories and at some point I woke up to the fact that I was every morning I was getting up and spending at least four hours writing stories depressing stories that I sent off to people in New York and apparently I wasn't even doing it well enough to get published but I love the stories the oral storytelling it made me laugh and I got to thinking why don't why can't I do that so I started imitating the uh, storytelling techniques of of these black people that I was spending a lot of time around later when we moved to Perryton and I started working on ranches I got back into the oral storytelling tradition that my ancestors had belonged to and it was a natural fit for me. So I found a home for humorous storytelling in Livestock Weekly and the Cattlemen and Western Horsemen. 
they never lost their sense of humor even in the hard times of the 60s uh, yeah that that oral tradition of storytelling has been fertile soil for me I think that it's related to the fact that country people had this close association with animals and animals restore our contact with the earth and uh, they have ways of humbling us and putting ourselves in our place and you either when you work around horses and dogs and livestock you either get so mad at them that you kill them or else you stop and laugh and people who <clears throat> have been in, involved in agriculture they have been forced to laugh at themselves and at life and uh, so it's it's been a uh, very fertile ground for me all right folks that's it for today's episode I'd like to thank John Erickson for taking the time to visit with me. You can find out more about John at hankthecowdog.com. You can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com. If you're enjoying the show and would like to help me keep it going, you could leave a donation on my website. Or you could write a review of the show on the iTunes store. Or you could just take the time to tell a friend to give the show a listen. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. Cowboy Crossroads.